Hey friends, Ariko Inuma here. Thanks for tuning in. Today, I wanted to make a video about music theory. And I hear often from other people who are into making music, like how much music theory do you need to know and um, do you really need it to write songs and stuff like that. And I'm going to answer that question in just a minute. But um, I've always wanted to create a, like a music theory primer where I can just sort of condense music theory into just the essential that you need to know to get by when you're making rock music, pop music, uh, country folk, those kind of music. I would say you can quote me on this, although it's not a scientific uh, measurement. Uh, I would say that what I'm about to share with you will cover about 90% of what you need to know for all music except classical and jazz. So there I said it, and I don't know how long this, this video is going to be, but I'll try to be succinct and just sort of tell you what you need to know. Okay? So let's go. So to begin with, let's talk about what is music theory. Music theory is a system of explaining how music is put together. Now notice how I said that. Music theory is a system in which you can explain how the music is put together. Do you really need to learn how to explain how it's put together in order to put it together? The answer is no. You do not need to know music theory to make music. You do not need to know music theory to write music. However, music theory has, in my opinion, three key benefits. The first one is that uh, you can understand a piece of music and why it sounds, it comes across, it uh, gives you the certain feelings or the effect or impact the way it does. And when you understand it, then you can learn to make music using that understanding. The second thing is you can use it to communicate with other musicians. As you know, music is a mystical thing and sometimes we're at loss of words as to explain what we're doing to other musicians or to understand what other musicians are doing and music theory gives you that language. And the third big advantage of learning uh, music theory is that it gives you a troubleshooting tool. Um, again, you don't need to know music theory to make music or to write music, however, when you're stuck, if you're improvising, if you're making new music, if you're writing music and you run into a problem where like this isn't working out. I'm stuck. Like I'm at a point A and I need to get to point B and I don't know how to make that you know, transition without seeming really abrupt and out of place. Right? These are real musical problems that you run into all the time and music theory can be a troubleshooting tool. So in my opinion, there is absolutely no harm in learning music theory. There is no way stifles your creative creativity in, in Actually, quite the opposite. I think music, learning music theory, or at least enough of it, will free you up from the burden of using awkward real language to communicate with each other and having a clear understanding of how music is put together so that you can collaborate and you can troubleshoot music together. And the music theory covers two fundamental areas. One is the harmony and the other one is the rhythm and these are two separate things and we will cover it in that order. So let's start with the harmonic side of the music theory. In Western music, it divides an octave into 12 equal steps. An octave is the word we use to describe a you know, distance between two frequencies that goes from you know, one set of octaves to the next set of octaves. So from A to A is an octave. Right, uh, and then B to B is an octave, and C to C is an octave. Basically, in Western music, we assign note names to or characters to different notes, and whatever we call A, an octave is the distance between this A and that A, and in between there are twelve even steps. These steps are called either semitones or half steps. Unfortunately, in Western music theory, what they call half step and whole step. It's kind of messed up, unfortunate, but it's that language is being used all the time, so I think I have to explain what it is. 
And uh, the reason why, although it's a 12 equal step, uh, the, you know, each individual step is called half step, is because uh, from A to B, it's actually not one step, it's actually two steps. So here is the one from A to either A sharp or B flat, and then from you know, that one of those, uh, A sharp or B flat to B is another step. So there are two steps, and that is why the steps are called a half step, and the two steps are called a whole step. And the distance between one note and another is called an interval. That is the word we use to describe, like the distance between the notes. Okay, one more clarification. Um, the sharp flat business, right? The sharp flat business is typically used to fill the gaps between notes that are two steps apart. And so A sharp and B flat is the exact same note. And the reason why, you know, why don't we have a different, like unique name and known as sharp uh, flat business, that's a bit outside the scope of today's conversation. Uh, I would su it's suffice it for you to know that if a particular key, say like let's say A, right? A is A, B, C sharp, D, E, F sharp, and G sharp, right? So all the sort of in between notes are using sharps and not flats, and that's uh, typically true in that if we are in the key of let's say F, right? F, G, A, and the next note is B flat, and the C, D, E, F. Okay, so that was not a great example. Uh, but basically, sharps and flats don't really mix in a single key. If they do, that is more of a temporary note that you just kind of changed it uh, to say that actually instead of E, I want to play E flat, but that's not really in the key. Um, that could happen, but um, just suffice it to say that, again, the, the important thing for you to know is that the sharps and flats are the same note. So if sharp and G flat is the same note, G sharp and A flat is the same note. And if, if you know that your key features a sharp notes or flat notes, typically you just stick to whichever one is being used to describe other notes that require sharps or flats. Uh, there are exceptions to that rule, but that's generally the rule of thumb. So, of all the 12 notes that are available in an octave, it is really not common for music to utilize all 12 different notes. In fact, what we typically do is we pick out some notes out of the 12 and form a scale, right? And that scale is being used to make the music, meaning that the uh, music contains chords and melodies made up of those notes. So a scale is basically a selection of notes taken out of the whole 12 steps that are available. And then chords are basically harmony that is created by combining different notes into a single harmony or, or chord. And as you know, chord is sometimes played all together and chord is sometimes spread out into arpeggios over time, right? But basically, different notes coming together to create a harmony is what we call, what we call a chord. So, of the 12 notes available, if you create a scale that basically traveled, you know, half step at a time, going uh, from one note to another and just used any notes available, what we might call that is a chromatic scale. A chromatic scale is the idea of basically not sort of picking out notes based on whatever sort of a predetermined condition and just kind of freely using whatever note is available. And then it usually moves in sort of a half step manner. But the most commonly used scale is what we call the major scale. And the major scale is defined by the use of seven notes that are picked out of 12 at a particular distance. 
So from uh, the root, which is the base of the scale and the center of a key. Um, key is the idea of a tonal center or the home base of a particular sort of a span of music. And the root is the note uh, in that forms the sort of the central note of that uh, key. So let's say that we're in the key of A, right? And the major scale means that the first uh, interval in the major scale is two steps. And the next interval is also two steps. The third step is a half step or one, right? And the next step is also two. Another step is two. And then one more step is two. And the last step back to the same oct the, the octave is one. So a major scale is a series of seven notes that have two, two, one, two, 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 one pattern counting from the root going up. So now that we have a scale made up of seven notes, uh, let's also uh, discuss the numbering of it. So in uh, Western music, we typically consider the root to be the one, right? And then just put a number on each note that uh, is built up on top of that. So this is two, which is two steps above the one, and this is three, oops, no, this is three right here, the C sharp. And the confusing thing is the three is four half steps above the root, right? And the next one is four, is the D note, which is actually five whole step, I mean five half steps above the thing. So, so on, so on and so forth. Um, you have uh, seven different notes, and then the last one is the octave, which is the eight. So if you're on a guitar, you can easily visualize, because each fret is basically a half step, right? So if you're on the A, and then the two step above is the B, two steps above is the C sharp, and then half step above that is the D. And then going two more steps, E, F sharp, G sharp, A. We now ourselves a major a scale. And major scales are known for being happier sounding, relatively speaking. Um, and then, uh, in fact, the major scale is considered such a sort of a central idea in Western music that a lot of the theory seems to revolve around the major scale being the default. And everything else is kind of like, how does it compare to the major scale? So in contrast to major scale, let's look at the minor scale, right? So if we're in the key of A minor, right? So then from the A minor, the first to the second degree or the second note is two steps. And then from the second to the third note is one step. And then the next note is two steps. The next note is two steps. The next one is one. And then the, the, the final two are both two steps each. So a minor scale is a series of seven notes picked out from the 12 with the intervals of 2, 1, 2, 2, 1, 2, 2. And minor scales, relatively speaking, are known for being sadder in comparison to the happier major scale. Now again, I say relatively because it's not always true, but typically, by default, they do come across that way. Okay, so let's think a little bit more about the chords. So as I said, chords are harmonies made up of multiple notes out of the, of the uh, notes that are available. And in particular, we're interested in triads. Triads are chords that are made up of three notes. And typically, triads feature uh, notes that are of a particular distance. If it's a major triad, let's say that we have a major triad based on C, so C major chord, right? C major chord is made up of C, 
E, which is four half steps apart, and an E to G, which is three half steps apart. This, the C, E, and G, is a C major chord. And the same thing as the major scales, major chords are typically considered happy or something. Now let's look at a minor chord instead. A minor chord is actually reverse of this in that the uh, first two notes is between C and E flat, which is three semitones apart, and then from E flat to G is four semitones apart. This is a minor chord or minor triad, and in contrast to the major chord, it typically sounds or comes across sadder. Okay, so on the whiteboard I drew out the names of the notes that are used in a C major scale. And let's look at how many different triads we can find using the C major. So again, triads typically are made up of three notes and if you're looking at the scale, it basically is every other note. So the first triad I will make is use a C, E, and G, right? You skip a note and then you find the next note and this is the C major triad. And because the distance between C to E and is, is the four half steps, we call this a major chord. Now, let's make another triad based on the second note in the scale, the D. So from D, we skip a note and go to F, and then from F to A, right? Now, the distance between D and F is three half steps, and distance between F and A is four. And the difference, the, the reason is because between E and F is only one step away. There's no sharp or flat, naturally, uh, between E and F. And I know that sounds random, and... Um, unexplainable, but that's just the way it is in Western music. The same thing happens between B and C is only one step away. So everywhere else is two steps uh, between E and F and B and C, there's only half a step. So that's why it falls this way. Now remember what I said about major and minor chords is that if the first interval is three, this is considered a minor chord. So Let's put a number on top of the notes, right? So root, as you know, is 1. And then we put a number there. And this is uh, used uh, in some communications. But basically, in the key of C, C major, right? The 1 chord, it will be a major chord because of the distance between the C and E, right? And the two chord distance between D and F is a three step, half steps, so that will be considered a minor chord. So you will start to see a pattern, and I can make you a chart uh, that you can see, I uh, put it on the screen. Uh, but uh, basically, in major scale, because the major scale is a very distinct pattern, um, you can make triads based on each of the notes in the scale and you can expect it to be either minor or major chord with the exception of the seven chord which is uh, a weird chord, chord called diminished chord. Uh, I'm not going to get into diminished chords today because it's not used very commonly. Um, in some older pop music and a more uh, complicated music like jazz, it's used very commonly, but outside of that, not as much, so it's a little outside the scope of today's discussion. But suffice it to say that if you start making chords or triads based on the notes in major or minor scales, most of the time you end up with major or minor chords. So as I said before, in Western music, we sort of think of the major scale as the default and major chord as the default. Default. So, like when we say it's a chord, you know, a chord is D, right? We are really talking about um, a triad 
based on the D as the root of the chord. And when we say the chord is D, we just mean that it's a D major chord. So in this case, this is not a D major chord, it's a D minor chord because the first interval is three steps. Then we add a small m and they call it a D minor chord. Or in some charts, you will see D with a minus sign. That also is indication of D minor. I also, in some systems, have seen minor chords being done with smaller letter, uh, whereas the major is done. But typically, M, small m or minus sign is still needed. So um, that's how it's written in uh, charts, chord charts, and stuff like that. So instead of just talking about this, let's hear how some of these chords sound. Okay, so let's say we're in the key of C. C major, right? So we are looking at creating the C major chord by going C, E, and G. That's a C major chord. Let's look at the number two chord, which is a D. D, F, A, D minor. That sounds sad, right? Next chord, the three chord, is E, G, B. Guess what, whether this is major or minor chord. It's a minor chord, right? Again, it's the same distance as it is between D, F, and A, right? E, G, and B. Now let's look at the next chord. F, F, A, C. Now that is a happier sounding chord, right? Um, and then the G, G, B, and D. That's another major. A is A, C, E. That's an A minor chord. And then here's the weird one, B, D, F, that is a diminished chord. Uh, if I have to describe it happy or sad, that sounds sad, but it's not the same thing as a uh, minor chord. This is a minor chord, this is a diminished chord. And then back to C. Okay, let's look at A minor as a scale. And these are the notes that are in the key of A minor, right? And then let's look at um, how you make triads based on these notes in the scale. So the first chord is A to C to E. This Because B and C is half step away, so this is three half steps. The next one is a four half steps. So this makes for A, you guessed it, minor chord, right? And then the next one, B to D, is a three notes or three half steps. And D to F is also three. So now this is why this is called diminished chord, in that the two chord in the minor scale is a diminished chord. Now, again, I stick by my statement saying that Diminished chords are not that often used in terms of rock, pop, folk, that sort of music. Uh, and I'll explain how typically people deal with that in just a minute. Um, anyway, so from C to E to G, we just uh, learned that that's a major chord, right? And then D to F to A is a minor, E to G back to B, that is a minor, F to A to C, you get the picture, that's a major chord. Um, so minor scale has basically, uh, again, mostly made up of minor and major chord, it's just that the diminished chord falls in the two, a second uh, is the chord, the triad that's based on the second note in the scale. The notes have sort of a default distance between them, right? B and C is half step away, E and F is half step away, everything else is two steps away. And the scale is made up of particular sort of a combination of notes in a particular distance away. Now, there are times in the context of the song where you don't want to stick to the notes that are available in the key, right? So if you're in the key of C, meaning that you just use the notes C, D, E, F, G, A, B, um, you may want other notes. There's nothing wrong with having other notes like B flat. Right? 
Um, so instead of playing B, you might play a B flat in a particular chord or in a scale, and that flat is called an accidental. An accidental is a temporary changing of a note from a scale in, in which you are um, deviating away from the notes in the scale to temporarily use a note that is out of it. So with that being said, uh, let's look at the chords in a minor scale. So the first one is, let's say we're in the key of A minor, then uh, A, C, E, that's a minor chord, B, D, F, that's a diminished chord, uh, and, that, and that is not very often used. The thir three chord is a C, E, G, that's a major chord, right? The four chord is D, F, A, that's a minor, five chord is E, G, B, up oh, E, G, B, and that's a minor, six chord is F, A, C, that's a major, uh, and the seventh chord, the G, B, D, that's a major chord, and then back to A minor. Actually, though, I, sh I, mis I misnamed it. So, uh, remember I said in the Western music, they often think of the major scale as the default, right? So, the numbering I said was not correct because if we said 3 in the key of A, actually that would be a C sharp because it's uh, 4 half steps away from the root there. So, we call this a flat 3 in that um, actually based on the idea of major scale being default the A minor scale has a uh, the third note being flat like half step lower than what is the default that's probably easier uh, explained in the chart okay so in terms of the numbering system Remember, so the major is the default, so we call it 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. Those are the notes in the major scale. If it's minor, uh, remember, so the, the, from the second to the third note, there's only one. So instead of calling the third note in the minor a regular 3, we say that's a flat 3 because that's half step lower than what we expect in the default major scale of the 3 note. And by the same token, 4 and 5 are the same distance away from the 1, but then the 6 is flat, so that's a flat 6, and the 7 is also a flat 7. So you will see uh, that description here and there in terms of uh, chords and notes being used in A minor scale. Of all the chords that are in A scale, the f obviously the most important one is the 1. Right? We're in the C major, and the next most important chord in the scale is the 5. So in the key of C, the 5 is the G chord, G major. And the reason is, be is because G has the B note, which is the half step below the root of the key, which is the C, right? And because of this half step being the third degree of the chord, right? So the chord is the G, and the next note is B. Now this, uh, the, uh, the second note in a triad is the most important because if you remember, that's the note that changes whether that's depending on the major or the minor. So. Um, that note is considered the most important one in the chord and when that note in the chord is the one that wants that is the closest to the center of the scale that creates uh, what we call a dominant sound or the desire to resolve to the center of the key so that's why when you hear G Right? Having that sort of 5 to 1, uh, we might call it 5 to 1 cadence, uh, has this strong sense of finality, like, you're like, you hear that and you're like, oh yeah, the song is done, I can go home happy now, right? It just has a very strong sense of finality. Now, the problem 
with minor uh, scale is that in my A minor, the five chord is E minor, and the third note or the, the well the second note in the triad, but the the, the third degree or the the note in the E minor chord is the G, and from G to A is a whole step away, so it doesn't quite have the same effect as the 5 to 1 in major scale, right? And that, that can still like be like a, you know, sort of a uh, tragic ending, I suppose, unhappy ending, <laughs> and you may be able to go home with that, but it just doesn't quite ring true, like, right? So a lot of times what happens is they add the accidental in the 5 chord and raise the G to G sharp so it can be only half step away from the center of the A and then that's why the 5 to 1 cadence in a minor scale can sound like this that G sharp in the E, e chord, E major chord is technically not in the minor scale but you use an accidental to raise that Right? Um, so minor scale has more complications because of the nature that um, when you're used to how the, in major scale the half steps fall within that minor scale it doesn't quite work the same way so uh, historically writers and composers kind of use the accidentals to sort of get away with that and there are more sort of ways in which it, um, minor scales could get altered and changed. Uh, for example, that not very often use two chord, which is a diminished chord, right? Um, uh, here, right? The B diminished chord wants to resolve to C because it's right next to the C chord, half step away, the root there. But that's not the center of the scale, so. Um, it's not very often used, this chord. In fact, if there is a B-based chord in the scale of key of A minor, I, I sometimes use a B minor chord by using an accidental one and putting the F sharp instead of F, which just makes, makes it a minor chord. Or I might use like a um, G over B. Which brings me to my next question. Um, so, when you're thinking about triad, I always said that it, whatever is the base or the root of the chord is the name of that chord, right? So, if we're making the C major chord, then the C is at the bottom. And then you just go up from C, E to G in that order. But actually, if you have C, E, and G in any which way, it's still considered a C major chord. So there's no rule that says that you have to have C in the bottom. Although that sounds most authentically C major, it's possible to have other notes at the bottom too. So for example, so it's G, C, E, right? That's also a C major chord, but in this case, when we write it, we use a slash to make sure that the player knows that G is at the bottom. So if we say C over G, it simply means that it's a C major chord, but with G as the note at the bottom. Or, and then, um, so when I said uh, in the key of A minor, if I wanted to build a chord out of B, I might use a G over B in that the chord of B, G, G, B, and D has that note, right? B, B in the uh, triad there, and instead of having a G at the bottom, I will put the B at the bottom. So B, D, G, that's a G over B chord, and then that seems to get along in the minor chord, a uh, minor sc uh, scale, than the diminished chord. Right?
And then I just explained about the difference between a minor 5 and major 5 in the minor scale. One last bit about um, scales and chords. In that, so I was describing the distance between the notes in the context of scale. The exact same con uh, concept applies when you're thinking about notes in a chord. So think of a chord as a temporary key just for a moment, right? And so if you are making a, let's say, an F chord in the key of C, right? So then temporarily while you're playing the F chord, the F becomes the number one and an F triad is made up of one, three, and five, right? Because you skip a note to make a triad. And the numbering system works so that it could, you, could add, uh, you could add one more note to triad. Do I call that a quad? I don't know. I've uh, never used the word, that word uh, in music theory, but uh, you could have a seventh note and make it a four note chord. And then actually the numbering system goes that you can keep skipping a note and then go beyond eight, right? One, three, five, seven, nine, eleven, thirteen. Those are all used in chords, so you can use it to describe that these are, you know, chords that uses those notes. Um, in addition to the 1, 3, and 5 that's always used to make a triad. And then uh, a suspended chord some, uh, is uh, implying that there's a 4 involved in there that instead of the 3. Uh, that's kind of advanced uh, music theory there, but I just want you to know that um, in the context of chord, you create the number system based on whatever is the main note of that chord not all the scale, right? So when you're talking about numbers that are assigned to the notes, you have to always keep in mind, am I talking about the notes in the chord or am I not talking about the notes in the scale? Because then the context changes and then different notes are given different numbers based on whether you're talking about the chord or the scale. So for example, you could say that there's a root of the scale, which is the main note of the key, if you're in the C major scale, C is the root of the scale. But if you're in the F major chord, F is the root of the chord. So I hope you can sort of understand the difference there. And if you start talking in numbers with you know, your collaborators, even if you get confused, you could ask, are you talking about the chord or the scale? Right? And a lot of times, actually, you might be talking about the core. Okay, so let's switch gear to the rhythmic theory. So in Western music, they use words like bar and or measure to note one sort of a unit of time in the song. And a measure or bar is nothing but a particular length of time and then you divide the measure or bar into subdivisions or, or to, into beats actually, let's, let's do beats first before subdivisions. So a measure or bar, those mean the same thing, are contained beats and the beats are noted by the, what we call the time signature. So in western music, especially in popular music, the most common time signature is 4-4 four, four. and what that means is the top 4, the first one, is the number of beats per measure. Meaning if you go 1, 2, 3, 4, that is one bar or one measure, right? And the bottom note, the second number, denotes the how long of a subdivision that um, note is taking place and then the 4 is quarter in that uh, you divide a um, particular arbitrary concept of a whole note and then a quarter of that is a quarter note and, and in the 4-4 four, four time signature you're basically saying the obvious or stating the obvious by saying I want, to, I want each bar to have 
four notes of quarter notes. Now, another time signature, other common time signature in um, popular music is 6 8. So let's guess what that would mean. It means that uh, you want to have six notes of the eighth note, meaning there is an arbitrary concept of whole note, and you divide that into eight different equal notes, and then you take six of that and call it a measure. Are you confused yet? <laughs> um, the idea of whole note is so arbitrary that, yeah, it's kind of like, why, you know, what's the rhyme and reason between calling anything whole, but unfortunately that's what music theory is based on for the rhythm per, uh, uh, from the rhythm perspective. Um, so don't think too much about why one is four and one is eight. What more, more important number is the top one, the first number, is that how many notes in a measure is there. So are you going to count to four or are you going to count to six? Right? The third uh, common um, time signature is 3, 4, meaning you divide the whole note into quarters and then you take, you take three of them and they call it a bar. 4-4 uh, four, four is the most common one. Most of the songs that you hear are in a 4-4. Four, four. You go 1, 2, 3, 4, and if you count or not, your head against the rhythm, you can count that it's divided into fours. Uh, six, eight has a swing to it. You count it mostly by going one and the two and the one and the two and the. So it's kind of like a two beats subdivided into groups of threes. Now the three, four, you can tell uh, because instead of this sort of a, a even sort of divide of threes of six, eight, it's a lot more sort of a centered around three and three four is the waltz rhythm so it's if you feel that the rhythm is one two three two two three 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 four three three right then that might be in the three four time signature but i would say three four is pretty rare in popular music um, uh, probably like 80 percent of the music is four four and maybe another Five to ten percent in six eight, and then the rest are in other time signatures. It's valid to have like five four measures, or six four measures, or seven four measures, right? It's also valid to have nine eight measures or twelve eight measures as well. So these are the variations of um, the time signatures that are commonly available in popular music and um, now you know. So in Western music, the notes are sort of noted for how long that note is and there is this mythical, mythical arbitrary notion of a whole note and then a whole note you divide into two and you get a half note. You divide that into half again and you get a quarter note you divide that into half again and you get an eighth note and you get the picture the next division is the 16th note and the 32nd and 64th notes right um, it's pretty arbitrary because what is a whole note right um, a whole note could be ye long or ye long based on how fast the song goes and the speed of the song is called tempo and tempo is measured by how many beats per minute um, that uh, note, that music sort of goes with um, and that is the tempo of the music. I do need to just visit a tiny bit of musical score to explain a particular concept and that is that um, I told you there's an arbitrary concept of a whole note and whole note is um, denoted by a um, oval figure on a musical score that is um, doesn't have any stems, like it doesn't have any vertical lines. Now if you have a uh, sort of, and then the whole note is just a circle or oval, right? And then a half note would have a stem, but it's still a dot 
with uh, it's just a circle. And then a quarter node is filled this part, so it's black and it has a stem, and that is the symbol for quarter node. Now, as you saw, quarter node is the four, you know, the quarter division of the whole node. But sometimes a node lasts one and a half of quarter notes, and we in the musical score we note notate that by adding a little dot by the main note and sometimes you hear words like dotted note or dotted rhythm it's referring to that and that is that um, when it's a one and a half beats worth of length the note is it's called a dotted quarter note and that could apply to the eighth note which is a one eighth note and one sixteenth note add to add to add it together to form a single note right um, and a quarter note is basically one quarter note and then one eighth note added um, which would make it 1.5 uh, quarter notes worth of length and we call it again a dotted quarter note so if you hear the word dotted in music just know that that is 1.5 times whatever the note that you're talking about. So in the most common time signature 4-4, four, four, there are 4 beats per measure, right? So the main sub, main division of a measure is called the beat. And then if you sort of have notes that go faster than quarter notes, that is considered the subdivided notes of that particular piece. And so uh, eighth notes, uh, subdivisions of quarter notes, and then um, sixteenth notes are further subdivisions of the beat. So you could count, you know, the four four time as in one, two, three, four, or one and two and three and four. And I'm now counting the eighth notes because I'm counting the subdivision. The second most common time signature of 6-8 is because the beat is based on the 8th notes in this case, um, we typically think of it as two beats that are subdivided into three different subdivisions. So it's one and a two and a one and a two and a. Um, so that is very different from 4-4 four, four world. Um, Something to think about in terms of the beats is the beats are not always uh, and the rhythm is not created always equal in that well, when we say something like downbeat, that means we're talking about the first beat, the landing of the new measure. That is called the downbeat. And then, uh, and then uh, the downbeat might be used to describe the main beats within the measure, right? So one, two, three, four, all counting downbeats. And then we sometimes call it upbeat, the in-betweens, the subdivided ones. So one and, two and, three and, four and, and then all the ands are counting the upbeats. In the world of guitar, uh, actually, the downbeats and upbeats have an actual meaning because we typically play the downbeats with the downstroke and then the upbeat with the upstroke. Right? So if you're doing like alternative picking or if you're doing like a funk rhythm, they all, you know, we always say, you know, keep the downbeats consistent, right? Right? I am only picking some of the notes, but the hands go up and down in a very consistent rhythm. And that is because the down and up stroke correspond to the down and up uh, beats. And that's how we sort of keep the sense of time consistent. Finally, um, combining the harmonic and the rhythmic uh, parts of the theory a little bit, there is a concept of harmonic rhythm and that is referring to the fact that in music it feels good to the listeners 
when the chords change at a regular sort of timing. So whether it's every bar or every two bars, every four bars, if you get in the sort of routine of changing chord every four bars, it feels good to the listener if the chords keep changing every four bars consistently. And if you deviate away from it, again, it feels good if you kind of deviate away from it in a pattern, right? So maybe you do three chords of four bars each, and then the last one time around, you do the two times, uh, two, two bars each per chord, right? Or something like that. Experiment, try it where the chords change at more random timing and see how it comes across. The music will feel a lot more unstable and it doesn't feel very fun to listen to. And maybe that's the effect that you're going for. That's totally valid. However, typically our ears expect chords to change at a predictable rhythm. And if you mess with that, you can create a very disorienting kind of like, I don't know what's going on kind of feeling. So take note of that and if you're writing songs, most of the time you're changing course at a regular predictable timing even without thinking about it. Uh, so it's probably nothing that you really have to worry about, but just know that there is a concept of harmonic rhythm and again, if you know the rule, you know when to break the rule too. So keep that in mind and play with that. Okay, so that wraps up my Music Studio Primer. I hope that you learned something from it and you hopefully got something out of it that maybe was confusing or perplexing before. Uh, I welcome your comments and questions. Uh, if you think that there are better ways to say or organize this, uh, I would love to know and perhaps I will do another you know, sort of iteration of the same thing some other time. If you really enjoyed this video, one thing that you can do that would really help me is uh, if you can obviously like and subscribe but if you could post about this video in whatever social media that you uh, frequent and say hey you know this guy had a cool video about music theory I learned something from it that would be really helpful uh, whatever you can do to sort of say uh, to your friends hey uh, this video was worthwhile that's a lot more powerful than me saying that come watch my videos, right? So uh, if you could do that, that will help me a lot. Alright, thanks again for watching. I'll see you next time.